Welcome back to the Talking Archive. My name is Josh Jacobs, and our conversation continues now with the 1976 and 1978 Best Country Music Disc Jockey at a station in a metropolitan area of one million or more, Larry Kenny. Now, what's your favorite memory of Dolly Parton and Willie Nelson? Both just the friendliest, you know, most welcoming people you can imagine. And um, one of the reasons, I think, is looking back on it now, is they were both in country, Kenny, Kenny Rogers and Willie, of course, and Dolly, all in country music. And once I got into country music, being a country music jockey in 1974, when I moved to Cleveland, w, uh, WKYC, uh, and started becoming familiar with the country music community, you know, because I would I would go down to Nashville three four times a year for a weekend or a week, and and you got to meet everybody. And back in those days, country music was so striving so hard to be mainstream. You know, mm-hmm. uh, today I mean, you know, country music stars are as big as anybody else, and uh, you see all these extravagant TV. Uh, shows and um, you see them everywhere, uh, but back then it wasn't quite the same. And they they were just they, they loved you so much for they loved the disc jockeys uh, who played country music around the country because that's they knew that that's the only way that country is going to become really big around the country is if the if radio stations play the records. It makes obvious sense, you mm-hmm. know. So back then it was they were just all so down to earth, and of course they they were naturally uh, these these are people who come from the country, you know, they come from the south and small towns, and they just couldn't do enough for you when you went down there. And I and uh, I remember that's where I met Willie Nelson. This is in about um, seventy five or six, and to this day, <laughs> I don't get to see him very often. But if he's appearing anywhere around here, I go to I go to the concert. But Willie has a thing with his good friends, especially in the business. Um, whenever you see each other, and it might be six months from now, it might be five years, you know, because they're always traveling. Mm-hmm. And the, but the deal is that whenever you bump into each other anywhere, the first thing out of both of your mouths has to be your latest idea <laughs> for a really funny country music title, a song. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so fun because uh, every time we'd have to you know, I remember uh, he came out here in New York one time just about uh, 15 years ago and um, uh, I wasn't doing I wasn't introducing him then I just thought I'd sneak into the concert and uh, when I got there his bus was outside of course and the Mickey Raphael his, his harmonica player was standing outside the bus smoking something and uh <laughs> mickey sees me and he says hey hey kenny can't come here come here he said you better hide because willie is just about to come out of the bus and i knew what he meant mm-hmm. get yourself ready because if you want to win the contest <laughs> <laughs> i said okay 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 and i get on the back of the bus around the back of the bus and i started thinking okay what can i come up with and let's see if i can remember now what i said and what he said um Willie comes out and looks at me, and he starts to say something, but then he goes, you know, you used to bite our tongue, so because we, we knew the first words out of your mouth had to be. And if you just said, hey, how you doing, you, you blew it, you know. So I, I woke up, to him, and he nods at me, meaning, you go first. <laughs> 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 and and um, I said, well, what did I say? I said, um, how can I miss you if you won't go away? <laughs> he, said, he said I got nothing after that how come I miss you you won't go away was that the title of his next hit <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was wondering if someday he was going to write that song that sounds like I a great be, song I like I that I think so too yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How can I miss you if you won't go away? Won't go away. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones over. The, some of the I'm trying to think of some of the other ones over the years that we we thrown at each other. Uh, he, uh, well, one time he said his his offering was, "I love you so much I can't shit." <laughs> 
I said, well, you got that one, man. I can't go anywhere from there. Well, that could be a, a, a hick hop tune because uh, there's that uh, blend of country and, and rap called yeah. hick hop. Uh, <laughs> 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 now, um, when you got to the Big Apple um, in 1976, uh, you're uh, on WHN, and around that time, um, Bob Murphy stepped down as host of Bowling for Dollars, and yeah, you became the host for the next uh, three years. Now, I confess, in Los Angeles, we had Bowling for Dollars out here with Chick Hearn as host. Chick Hearn. I used to watch it all the time. In fact, the first, I don't know, couple of years of my life, I just knew him as Chicky Baby. I didn't even know his full name. And um, w- our friend went <laughs> went down to a taping, and I was there. I was about two and a half years old, so that was the first game show I ever attended, but I'm just too young to remember it. Our friend Karen, she uh, got the gutter ball on the first roll, but then on the second roll, knocked down eight pins and won $8. Um, <laughs> yeah, but his, yes, yes, but remember, his pin pal had won $8, too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then I found out about uh, 10 years after the show went away, my neighbor down the street, she was on Bowling for Dollars, and she was um, probably the closest thing to white trailer trash you had. And she's like, that SOB who bowled before me got the jackpot worth $1,000, and so when I went up, it was only a lousy 250 bucks. And so... <laughs> <laughs> and so she got a strike on the first ball, but the second ball got nine pins and won twenty five dollars. <laughs> but uh, Listen, you are you're not going to believe this. But when I was a kid growing up in uh, Peoria, Illinois, and mm-hmm. I, actually, I actually lived in Pekin, Illinois, which is a you know a suburb twelve miles away. But when I was growing up, Chick Hearn was the sportscaster on one of the local TV stations. Wow! Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. And, uh, he used to he used to do. A, uh, we, we were in Peoria, so it was halfway between Chicago and St. Louis. And back there, if you were a baseball fan, you were either a Cubs fan or a Cardinal fan because Peoria is almost exactly halfway between, you know, between those two cities. Mm-hmm. So it was always a big, you know, a big um, opposition between Cubs fans and Cardinal fans. Because there were a lot of both of them you know, who lived around there, and Chick would always open the, his part of the, the news at night, and you knew immediately who won the game because he would have the, either the happy cub or the sad cub, uh, little puppets on his desk. <laughs> he was a cub man, <laughs> and the, and uh, we used to have a joke back there. They probably still do. <clears throat> uh, cub fans and and uh, Cardinal fans. And now I can't remember what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cute joke, too. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, 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 it's coming. It's coming back. It's coming back. Uh, now it's gone again. Oh. Hey, I'm I'm 76 years old, man. You know? <laughs> <laughs> My mom turns 76 on uh, on actually tomorrow. She turns 76. So, uh. <laughs> oh, what's your happy birthday for me? Well, thank you. I will do definitely. And uh, also another thing with bowling for dollars, whenever it would come on. I go into my closet, get my suit on, stand in front of the TV set. I had a little plastic bowling set, and I put that in front of the TV as well and hold a cup, yeah. pretend it was a microphone. And my mom says, I don't remember this. She said, every time they get a gutter ball, you'd cry. So I guess I cried quite a bit watching Bowling for Dollars. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? We, we were not allowed to call it the gutter. It was called the channel. That's right. Uh, Pro and Bowlers Tour does. Yeah, yeah, the producers of the show. See, this, that show was done in like 15 different cities, probably, each with a, a local host and, and, and local contestants, which was the whole idea. Because, mm-hmm. you know, game shows had always been, and today still are mostly, you have to, the network ones, you have to audition several times to be on the show. You know, they want the right looking people, they want the right uh, enthusiasm, people who have the right enthusiasm, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, but back then, uh, we just had, he, he just sent in a uh, a postcard, and uh, if you want to be a pin pal, mm-hmm. you know. So we never saw the contestants before they got there. Wow! And it uh, turned out some, some stories out of that. <laughs> but, uh, again, I can't think of it one in particular right now. Mm-hmm. But, uh, <laughs> and it was taped at uh, Masson Square Garden Lanes in uh, New York City. Uh, I saw. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that, that's, that's not around anymore. 
What's that? Uh, Madison Square Garden Lanes isn't around anymore for my Oh, hurry. the lanes, no, the bowling is gone from there, yeah, a long hmm. time ago. Turned oh, into okay. Turned into a theater. Uh, I said, oh, there's another thing. You couldn't say bowling alley. Couldn't say bowling alley. It was uh, bowling lanes. Mm. Yeah. Wow. The reason for that is, at, at about that time, back in the early 70s, bowling was trying to make a comeback and trying to change its image. Uh, when I was a kid, at least, and we used to go bowling, you know, it was a smoky place, hazy smoke, and um, just felt kind of, kind of dark, you know. And people get drunk all the time in bowling. <laughs> <laughs> so they, to, to make it more uh, family-friendly, they started saying things like, don't call it an alley, it's a channel. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a... It's not, uh, it's not a uh, what was I going to say the other one? That's not bowling alley, it's bowling lanes, I think it was. That, exactly, it's bowling lanes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because Bowling for Dollars on KTLA 5 um, was on from 72 to 76, and it was taped at uh, what was then called Golden West Studios. Uh, yeah. Later was Tribune Studios. And then for, I don't Golden remember. Golden West, I think, was owned by Gene Autry. That's right. Uh, Gene Autry yeah. owned uh, Golden West. And then um, the last six months that it was on KTLA 5, Jim Lang was the host, but I do not yes. remember Jim Lang hosting it. Um, but then mm -hmm. when the Lakers moved to KHJ TV 9, uh, they brought Bowling for Dollars back in 1978 and was <clears throat> filmed at the Grand yeah. Central Bowl in Glendale, which was such a huge alley that they actually had lanes on both sides. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, uh, Josh, what did I tell you? Uh, oops. <laughs> you, said, you said the nasty word. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> kids, nothing, I'm telling you. I wish I had a game show buzzer with me right now. Uh, <laughs> 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 which Bowling for Dollars didn't have. Uh, <laughs> but I love the camera would flash in and out, you know, t whenever they won the jackpot, you know, that, that cool effect that was just so inexpensive, but just as a little kid, I thought, this is so cool, but as a grum's like, wow, that really was low budget. <laughs> it, <wasn't it? laughs> oh, yeah. it, was a, it was a rather um, primitive set, uh, as you recall. <laughs> In fact, but the one in, of, the one in, in uh, on on KTLA looked just like they had that door that op slid open then slid shut. Yeah, yes, <laughs> and, and you know there, there was a guy behind the wall opening that and closing it. And I mean, t today it's all you know electric. And oh yeah, stuff. but uh, the guy we had kept falling asleep all the time, <laughs> and so I would <laughs> somebody would finish bowling, you know, in the next and it's time for the next contestant, and I would say, "Hi." But jackpot is, you know, $38 million. Oh, not really. And, uh. Um, 38 million cents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, let's bring out another contestant. And at that point, the door was supposed to start slowly opening. As mm -hmm. I mentioned, as I said the name, uh, here's Bill Thompson from Brooklyn, New York. And I turned around. <laughs> <laughs> the door is still closed. <laughs> so what can you do? Well, we're not. It wasn't on live. We, we taped them all, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, but um, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't want to shut the production down and have to, you know, start all over again. So I just kind of went back and hello. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, the door. The door was finally open. <laughs> the original Tic Tac Doe with Jack Berry in the 1950s. Yeah. That's how they also had the contestants come through that door that pulled open, then shut, and then pulled open for yeah. the next. It was yeah. just the, you know, back then it was like, hey, this is so cool. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to think. Um, you mentioned the, the guy who did it on K KRLA was. Um, who do you, you, you just say it was? Oh, uh, oh, Jack Berry was on Tic Tac Doe on uh, NBC oh, Daytime right. back in the late fifties. But there were the, the game show host. Uh, I go on to do the other game show, Jim Lang. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jim Lang. Mm -hmm. And in San Francisco, it was Wink Martindale. Maybe. That's right. Yeah, because uh, wow, I didn't, I didn't know that. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, Wink was mainly based out here. I'm sure he just flew up to the Bay Area. And kind of yeah. like Jim Lang lived in the Bay Area and always fly, fly down to uh, Southern California whenever he hosts his game shows from the dating game to yeah. all the other shows that he did that didn't last yeah. as, anywhere near as long as the dating game did. <laughs> <laughs>
But I, I, I heard, I, I've heard nothing but nice things about uh, about Jim Lang, uh, gentleman yeah, Jim. I never met him. Me neither. Um, I've went, I've met Wink Martindale, um, mm-hmm. and gotten to meet a couple times. It was nice. Monty Hall, uh, Tom Kennedy, and Jack Nars, who are both gone now. Yeah. So is Monty. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, um, gosh, I'm drawing a blank on the other ones I've met, but it's a bit, uh, Peter Marshall, uh, Art James. I uh, got to meet Gene Wood, Burn Bennett um, wow. at different conventions. And, um, That's great. So it's really cool. And then um, Bob Barker was at a convention we went to, but he got there after we all sat down and left before we got up you know, from the, the event. So none of us got to meet him, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, the um, – so – Around the time you were doing Bowling for Dollars, you moved from uh, WHN to Y97 uh, in New York. And yeah. then um, WHK, uh, WHKH, uh, 106.7. WKHK, WKHK. Oh, okay, WKHK. Yeah, cool. called it Kick, uh, Kick 104, I think it was, something like that. Oh, okay, cool. But it was an FM station. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah. did you notice that there was a uh, move to FM by the late 70s? Is that why you made the move there from AM? Well, um, yeah, I guess part of that, part of what, most of it was the money, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, back uh, when I started, we were, again, in the 60s, uh, FM stations were only, uh, there were religious shows on them, um, a lot of classical music, you know, and um, um, oh, different things like that. And there were, I think, hardly any. FM stations, at least in the in the East, you know, have been this way in the West Coast. But uh, few, if any, FM stations that played top forty music or, or rock music mm-hmm. or anything like that. Um, so, um, uh, so you know, most people never heard of. I mean, the mass of the majority of listeners in any city would listen to AM radio. In fact, back then, there weren't even FM radios in cars. Oh, that's right, yeah. For, for the longest time, you know, because FM was considered like the, the what do you call it, the stepdaughter of, uh, of AM radio. And strangely enough, it's beginning to, to reverse now. I just heard on the radio the other day that a lot of car makers are going to stop putting FM radios in cars. I mean, AM radio. That's right, yeah. Cars, unless you pay extra for it. Isn't that amazing? So, yeah, I know. It's just a complete, complete turnaround. I mean, uh, I remember um, reading about, uh, well, on the West Coast, there was Big Daddy Tom Donahue and B. Mitchell Reed from San Francisco and L.A. Yeah. who met up yeah. at the Monterey Pop Festival and pretty much started that freeform FM rock stations in that, mm-hmm. in that area. And then in New York, there was Roscoe. Um, and he was even in LA for a little bit, but New, yeah. New York was yeah. pretty much where he pioneered that format. And um, this is Roscoe because <laughs> he worked, he, he came to New York, you know, after that. That's right, yeah. And then he, um, yeah. but unfortunately with FM, you, you can't carry over like the AM signals can, so you weren't able to yeah. listen uh, in other markets. But yeah. it was just, um, it was pretty much, I remember my dad as, as a little kid, and my dad would say to me, Josh. Now, AM is in mono has lots of commercials. FM is in stereo and has very few commercials. <laughs> Back then, that's Back true. Back then, it was true. <laughs> then oh, I finally yeah. realized in the late 80s, like, wait a minute, FM has a lot of commercials. But then... <laughs> <laughs> Not back then, because, you know, nobody was listening to it. No. <laughs> so, big change. This is the Talking Archive. My name is Josh Jacobs. We're talking with Larry Kenny. And next time, he discusses how he became a 35-year employee, kind of moonlighting for a very popular New York and eventually syndicated radio show in the morning.